So, I'm, like I said, I'm Rob Perkins. I'm with the police department. Uh, I'm a sergeant there. Um, I am originally not from Janesville, but I've been here about 15 years. So, one of the things when we kind of started, when I, when I got promoted and started helping with the special events was seeing all these cool things that, that Janesville really had to offer. Um, and it's been kind of neat over the years. So, um, I'll let Chief Murphy introduce himself, but go ahead. Oh, okay. So... Um, I've uh, lived here all my life, so a little bit different. Uh, I am related to Paul, which some people may think is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so years ago, it started for the fire department and the police department that we started to plan, start up official plans or written plans that we can review, pass out to organizers and to staffs of police, fire, DPW uh, city management when Mitt Romney came and spoke to forward Janesville that's when Sergeant Blazer from the PD and I said you know we really need to start putting things on paper and you know the person just ran for president not six months before that so you know there was okay we need to start gauging our threats of okay what kind of threat is involved with the Janesville Town Square Grand Prix or you know the uh, Easter Bunny down at uh, Festival Street yesterday. Between he and I and Shelly Slaypack, we kind of talk about things and decide, okay, is this something we need to have a formal plan for, or is it just something we need to maybe speak to the organizers, or maybe just review the documents themselves and say it looks good to us. So what we'll kind of cover today is just what we're gonna ask from you guys that wanna host an event in the city. Um, some of the, the documents and things that we're gonna ask for are gonna be included in there, but there's a lot of this stuff that goes on behind the scenes too, just to make sure that the event goes off without a hitch and you guys can worry about the, the fun part of it. We'll take care of all the safety end of things, um, but we wanna make sure that it's safe for everybody that, that attends for it too. So we got a short PowerPoint. It's, it's, it's not too long, we'll, we won't, we'll keep you somewhat engaged too. So there's a lot of familiar faces in here too. I know Julia, we've worked together on, on the Turkey Trot, um, you know, uh, John and Paul with the, with the Grand Prix. And those, those are different scaled events too. Those are probably some larger ones that we have in the city, um, but there's different sizes of these too. We'll, we'll talk even about just if you're gonna have a block party um, and kind of how some of those all. So some of the things we need up front, and these all go with, um, you'll, 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 you're, You'll hear from uh, Shelly Slapek later about the permitting things. That's all going to be included in these. So the dates and the times, the locations, um, any road closures we need to, to have. We don't really like to have road closures in the city. That, that's one thing we try to stray away from, um, especially when it's downtown. I know we've had it set up with Festival Street. We have some bollards set up. So yesterday, if you drove past during the, the bunny, um, the Easter Bunny down there, you saw that the bollards were set up and you can't actually physically get through there. There are barricades that go in the middle of the road um, and you can't push, in, a vehicle can't go through there. But there's also, um, you know, people like to have block parties, which we understand. But we're probably not gonna have a block party um, in the middle of Milwaukee Street <laughs> either, <laughs> right? So, you know, the residential streets, that's okay, but we try to keep the roads open the most, the most we can. Um, runs things like that. We try to leave the course open. It's not a closed course. Um, so it, we kind of scale up. And it also depends on the number of attendants that comes with things too, right? So um, those are all things that we like to do. If there is a road closure, that has to get approved by the police department on those. And I am the point of contact for that. So if there is something we can talk and we can figure out, it's not going to be a hard no. We can sometimes figure out a way to, to make that work for you on things too. The anticipated attendance per day, that's one of the driving forces of how many public safety officials do you need there, if you need any. And sometimes a lot of these runs and walks that happen, there's nobody there. We're just aware that the event's happening and we tell our patrol officers, the fire department, that those events are going on throughout the day and they kind of make sure that they give an extra presence to that area. Um, I know like uh, the Burt Blaine run walk that happens downtown. 
we don't have any staff that comes in for that day for that. They, they go out and they do their thing, we're aware of it, and it doesn't become, there, there's no uh, police or fire presence there during that time. So, um, but those are all things we do. If you're gonna have an event with 3,000 people, <laughs> kinda like to know that. The attendance yesterday was skyrocketed on that one. We weren't aware that that was gonna be that many people. Great attendance, um, but that, that was more than we were anticipating on that one too. So, um, the alcohol served on site, that sometimes plays into a fact, are we gonna have an officer there during that time? Because obviously, you know, when people start drinking alcohol, sometimes they get overserved, and then there's problems, right? Um, but it also depends on the event. Uh, Flannel Fest, that event kind of revolves around alcohol, right? <laughs> um, but it's a good, it's a good event, um, it's, but it's also ticketed too. It's a, it's, a, it's a ticketed event that people pay to come there, so normally it's, it's fairly under control. Um, the free ones where alcohol is involved, that's normally where we, we see problems. If there's a ticketed event with alcohol, the wine walk downtown, um, those, those are fine. Um, but those are also things that we like to learn, know ahead of time as well, because it helps us um, let our people know about them as well. Um, you'll hear later how to kind of pull alcohol permits and things like that. There's, there's somebody that's gonna speak to that as well. Um, is there any private security? Some people will have private security. Uh, can Do Industries does the dragon boat races down on the Rock River, um, I wanna say fallish time, right? Um, really cool event, they bring in some boats, hand carved wooden boats that they race up and down the river. But they also leave those there overnight too. And those are, I think they're, they're brought in from Canada, I think they are. So, they, they, they actually hire a security company to watch those boats overnight. So if there are gonna be any boats that, that happen or anything that happens down there, we like to know if there's gonna be somebody down there watching those. Um, just especially if they're armed security too, just for everybody's safety, we like to know that too. And we'll work with that security company to make sure that, that everything goes off um, without a hitch on that too. So just who the point of contact is for them, um, we get that number ahead of time and we'll work, we'll contact the security company, we'll, here's our number, if you need something, feel free, give us a call. We'll cover fireworks. Sure. Um, so as Sergeant Perkins mentioned, contacts for the event isn't limited just to security, um, but it's uh, the people who are gonna be, for the most part, on site that day. It's okay for an organizer of the overall event um, to be listed, but we want the person that is on site that if there is an issue, we can contact them by phone and find them and have a face-to-face -face with them if whether it's a law enforcement issue or it's some other thing that we just want to touch base with the, the person on. Um, any medical staff on site, um, the fire department does provide um, on-site uh, medical for some events, but um, a lot of times there is a cost associated with that, which we'll talk about in a little while. Hazards on site, fireworks, uh, large propane tanks like for the uh, corn roast, aerial displays, the fireworks, things like that, or it, it's even helpful for us to know if you plan on flying a uh, drone or a UAV up in the air. We do like to know that. Uh, permits wise, the fireworks permit does come from the fire department. Uh, and like I stated and Rob stated, Shelly Slaypack will talk, talk more about that. But propane tanks, things like that, you know, do you have fire extinguishers there? Make sure they're chained. The fire inspector uh, and fire marshal, they usually come down and take a look at that if it's a larger event. But just stuff for you guys to know too if you do have things like that. It is good to have a fire extinguisher and or chain larger propane tanks to something substantial so they don't tip over and fly away. Weather impact. One of the things you need to ask yourself is how would weather impact your event? If it's downtown here, have you planned for, if it's inclement weather where we need to evacuate, where are people gonna go? Uh, police and fire can kinda help you with that, and maybe uh, Paul and John can kinda touch on how they went about talking to businesses down in the downtown area for the Janesville Grand Prix about, hey, is it all right if people can come and shelter in here if we have inclement weather? I think that's kind of how you guys went about it. And we learned from the first year that we had the severe thunderstorms. And 
didn't have a good idea that some of the businesses just opened up their places, but um, some standard ones are the YMCA Boys and Girls Club. They've got the large gym on the first floor for the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, the um, Old Town Mall um, Church. That's the church, it's called, uh, is that the uh, First Congregation Mall? Yeah. But anyways, downtown, the east side of the river, it's real easy because there's a lot of businesses that are open there, and you can go into the to the bars and restaurants easily just to get shelter. The west side of the river, you have to find it and get permission from the Y and the Royal <coughs> Club. Uh, the Women's Club is also a good uh, point of shelter. So um, we learned all, all parties, police, fire, and the organizers learned the first year. So after 2018, we now have it located on our volunteer card. So the volunteers even know that if we did have a situation that they can direct people to the five shelters that we have established. So wherever your event is, you may just have to reach out to businesses and locations around there. Tracks or parks a little more of a challenge. There really isn't anything substantial that's really close. Some of the other things that need to be considered as an event planner is your staff and your volunteers that are down there. If it's really, really hot, you're going to have to make sure that not everybody's going to come prepared with their own water, sunscreen, shade, things like that. The other thing is, is they may need to take your volunteers may, to, may be asked to, you know, or they may want to work a little shorter period of time out in the weather just because it is warm or cold. One other thing with the weather is find a location that's nearby that can that can have a shelter. The bike race, obviously, it's very large across the downtown. Um, most events are typically in one location. So just find a business that's willing to open up in case there is. The, the 4-H fair at the fairgrounds, they use First Lutheran Church across the street as their shelter during that time if they have to, have to do it. So just find somebody that's willing to partner with you on that. Um, and it, it always typically works out. One other thing we like to see is these overhead maps. Um, of, of kind of how the event's gonna set, set up. So if police and fire are not on site during the time, we at least know what it's gonna look like when we show up that day and what you're kind of anticipating. We get these here probably, it's gonna be draft form um, because things may change. Um, don't feel that if you give us a map and all of a sudden you have to move a 10 by 10 tent from one spot to another, you gotta tell, it's not that big a deal, um, but it does just, kind of help us lay out of if you have a big grandstand or something where that's going to be and where the medical tents or where where we may need to re, to respond to the other thing that helps us out and this is this is a little hard to see but the route maps so a lot of runs and things happen in Janesville um, where are you going to run to we look at major intersections that it's going to cross um, other problematic areas we may we may have to address or may have to set something up with um, so we like to see the overhead route map. So either like a, a Google map. Um, uh, yeah, the Google maps. Th are the, those are probably the easiest to Yeah, even do. if you just draw it in and then make a photocopy and send it to us, that's, yep. that works for us. And all that can get attached right to the, to the permit too when you submit the permit on those. So route maps and then a map of the actual overhead of what kind of the setup of that area is gonna look like. Um, if it's in a gated area, or a, um, say if something's gonna happen at the youth sports complex, how is that gonna look? What, what's gonna be kind of the, the flow of traffic going through there? And then if we have an emergency, where are we going to come to? Where do you want us to come to actually get to that location from? Um, so if it's at Tracks or Park Cape, we need you to come to the warming house. Um, if it's at the sports complex, we need you to come into the, the west side fields, or I'm sorry, the east side fields and then meet us at this spot and have these predetermined locations where some of that may happen if there is an emergency in one of those situations, right? Just helps us respond and everybody, and then you let your volunteers know, I need to take this person over here and then we'll get there and we can help them. And it, it just cuts down on some of the response time for that as well. Um, I know with the 4-H fair, we go to a certain gate up there. Is there always an emergency gate up there? Um, so, so blocking streets, we talked about this. 
One thing that we just like to encourage, if, if a road's gonna get blocked, and they do, we have the farmer's market downtown that happens, is we, we try to like it to leave a lane that if something happens to a building or a structure in that area, we can actually get an emergency vehicle through it, right? Um, so if we gotta go down the middle of Main Street, we can still do that with a brush truck or a squad car. We can get something, an emergency vehicle down to those locations. If we're gonna do a block party, if you can encourage people to all park on one side of the street, that would be helpful, because then we can leave the other side open. If we need to open the street back up and get an emergency vehicle down it, we can. Um, but, but don't just jam everything, everything in there so you kind of have a maze to walk through. It's easier if, if, a little things are th if things are a little bit more cordoned off on those. And we did put in there too for the block parties where you're just given the, or the uh, A-frame barricades. There's nothing wrong with parking vehicles behind there to kind of protect the area so you're not as worried about somebody maybe just being confused driving through or getting mad and trying to drive through. But that person and those keys need to be within shouting distance. So if we come up to that area, that car needs to be moved or vehicle needs to be moved immediately. We have no problem with you guys protecting those areas with something substantial, but somebody needs to be around to move it if it needs to be moved. So the fire department, police department, and Shelly Slaypack, and from time to time DPW all come together um, for the Grand Prix engineering. There's a lot of different groups within the city that come together to build what's called an incident action plan. And this is a written plan that police and fire and other city leaders look to to guide us if something does occur in that area. But it also gives us, okay, uh, a medical plan. Closest hospital to this area is this far away. Uh, they're aware of it. Bigger events, we make the hospitals aware. Uh, communications plans. What channel is the police department and fire department going to be on? Uh, for the Grand Prix, uh, we need to make sure that the radio channels that they're using for their private radios do not conflict with the radio channels we're using. Or we may try to download them into our own system to where we can speak to them that way. Unified command, there may be a location like the Grand Prix where there's a trailer, um, maybe fire station one, maybe the police department where our unified command will be, which we would always let you guys know if it's a larger event where we're setting up. And we may ask for a representative to be available, like for the Grand Prix, a representative from that group needs to be available if something occurs and we need to bring them within that command structure. So for mo most events, we don't typically have this command set somewhere. We do for parades, uh, the bike race we do, um, just because of the large scale nature of those. For most of these, we don't have an active command going on. So I think for most events that we have, I'd say 95% of them, we don't have people physically somewhere where that's going on. It may be one person that's out doing things. Um, so like for the turkey trot, it's, it's me being out there um, and I have the phone numbers to call if something does happen. Um, but we don't have these. Sometimes when DPW gets involved, we'll, we'll set these up, so. So we do keep a very close eye on tra trends that go around the nation. I know after the, uh, the tragic event in Waukesha uh, last winter, or before the, the holiday parade over that we had here is the week before, um, that night we were all on the phone with each other, um, kind of trying to figure out what we were going to do. Um, there was a response that we had from that, but we also keep, in, keep informed of national events that, that take place as well. So we'll really use those and, and try to mitigate some of the stuff that takes, heart, that takes place to harden our barriers. So that's when we talk about putting vehicles in front of those roads, that's what we're talking about is hardened barriers on those. So um, one thing we've done with the farmer's market is they have a big box truck that someone brings down with plants in it. So we'll take that box truck and ask them to park it sideways across and their booth is right there. So if we do need to get an emergency vehicle in, we can just walk up to the booth, hey, can you move your box truck? And they know they pull it away. But it helps harden that bar barrier a little bit. Downtown, the bollards definitely help but those do only protect the streets too. Obviously the lawn area around is, is still open. So it's, it's trying to mitigate those. Some of it's just an appearance too, right? It's a deterrence that we have by appearance. Um, so that helps. Anything else on that? No, I don't. Okay. So
So just kind of covering our expenses, um, when, when we do ask, or when you do ask for a police or fire to be at there at an event, um, for one firefighter or EMT, it's $45 an hour for them. And then an apparatus may co uh, cost more for those events. Is there a cost that you have? Uh, each vehicle has a different cost associated with it, and it depends on what you're asking for, the timing, the event, things like that, whether uh, we utilize that cost or not. So for the police department, it is uh, $59 an hour for an officer. Where we get those is the average overtime rate for an officer, because it is on overtime. We don't pull from, from those, and that you get one police officer and a vehicle that comes with it. So if, if there is something that you really want, um, that comes along with it. One thing we do ask too is that you provide the billing, uh, who it gets billed to for those, and then as well as uh, I believe it's the um, not-for-profit or whoever whoever's handling that, where that needs to get sent to. So sometimes there is a, a cost to have us come out and help with, with some of those events. So, so some people know it doesn't count a beer gun. What's that? It doesn't count a beer gun, like having security of a beer gun. You guys won't do that. Correct, correct. It would be outside the area. Typically, yes. Correct. Yep. Looks like we're running... Uh... We'll touch on... If, the, if you do have an attendance that gets very large, 3,000 people, we can put a notification into the National Weather Service, and we can, we can then monitor that with them. We'll just give them one of our phone numbers. They'll call us. Hey, it's going to storm. Most of the time, though, it's like we can pull up the radar and look ourselves too, you know. But they'll, uh, we've had it with the bike race where there are some tornado warnings or there's been severe weather. They'll call us and be like, "You're going to be okay. It's going to go south of you," or "Hey, it's coming right at you," um, you know those. But the attendance does have to be fairly large in those. And that can only be done. It's only a police, fire, or a city official that can request that and work with the National Weather Service. Private organizations aren't able to do that. So if you do have an event, and most people advertise through social media nowadays, so either Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, I, whatever else is out there, I'm not the social media guru, but if you see something on there like this looks concerning, um, call us, let us know, and we'll address it. We'll, we'll either seek that person out or we'll use it for intelligence from our end of this is something we need to keep an extra eye on. Um, we do like to know those. We do those for all political events. It's a very standard thing that we do. Um, we have a lot of young people that work with us now and are very good at that stuff. So we will, uh, we will look at that, those, those threats. If it is something concerning, we will go out and address it with, the, with that person. All right, looks like uh, we're a couple minutes uh, behind. So we just... have a minute and a half for questions. They're doing the same thing, and then we'll stop. So. Paul. Question in regards to the drones. Um, doesn't it, uh, was it Officer Carpenter who used to have to, have to go through him to get authorization to have a drone to, at an event? There, there are drone statutes and things that prohibit certain things. I, I would have to, if we have a drone question, I would have to defer to him on those and figure out, address those one at a time because I'm not up to speed on on a lot of those. We, d we like to know uh, because all of a sudden people start to freak out. But there are some limitations with drone flying. Some things have changed with drones too yeah. to where people can, I, th I forget exactly what it is, but uh, they don't need permitting and other things to fly over crowds any longer. So there is some changes with drones. Okay. So I think our contact information is on your programs. So if there is something that you, you have or there's a question you have, feel free to reach out to one of us, um, or, or Shelly as well, um, and we can either send the question to the right person or we can, we'll answer it ourselves. So, um, yes, thank you for having us today. Yeah, thank you.